Hi, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Matt Smith. I'm the Vice President and Principal Media Evangelist for Bright Cove, um, one of the uh, larger uh, OVPs in the space. Um, and today we're here to talk about delivering content in a multi-device world, technical challenges and solutions. We'll get to the synopsis here in a second, but first, um, join me in welcoming our panelists. I want to go through and introduce you to them and, and find out about some of their experience that they're going to bring to the panel. So first, Ben Miller is joining us from uh, Sinclair Digital. Ben, welcome. Thanks. Yeah, I'm Ben Miller. I'm Vice President of uh, Digital Product Development at Sinclair Digital, which is uh, the digital arm of Sinclair Broadcast Group, which is America's largest television broadcaster. Um, the group that I run is primarily responsible for Converge Media, taking, taking the media business from the television broadcast world you know, into the digital world, making that a seamless experience, vending the tools, vending the infrastructure, and then also revving the user experience. And so we have everything from engineering to product development to, to creative under me. Um, and so we get to see all of the technical challenges across the board from all ends of the spectrum pretty much every day. And you have an outstanding hair game, too, by the way. Yeah. I just uh, wake up like this. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Some in the back there, too, has got an outstanding hair game. Uh, Kirby Grimes is here from uh, Float Left. Kirby, welcome. Thank you. I'm Kirby Grimes with Float Left Interactive. I'm head of corporate development. Uh, Float Left provides front end application solutions to media companies, broadcasters, ultimately helping them drive their OTT and TV everywhere services across all connected and connected TV and mobile platforms. Great, thank you. Jeff Tapper is here from Viacom. Welcome, Jeff. Hi, I'm Jeff. I uh, recently started at Viacom back in April. I run the uh, engineering group in New York City now, and as you probably know, Viacom's a big media company that uh, has a couple dozen uh, cable networks and over 100 countries, I believe, currently, and we're on any platform that anyone can imagine we would want to be on. <laughs> Great, thank you. And uh, on the end, um, but still just as important, Ron Pruitt is here from Al Roker Entertainment Company. Welcome. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Ron Pruitt. I work with Al Roker in New York. And um, I'm sure most of you know who Al is from NBC's Today Show and other shows on television. He's but got he's gray also. Hair too. Sorry? He's got gray hair, too. <laughs> he does. Well, I've gotten gray hair since I started working with Al, but that's another story. Yeah. Um, yeah, but he is a pioneer in uh, television production. He's actually had his own production group in New York for about 20 years doing traditional TV. We started working together a couple years ago with a group uh, and have formed Roker Labs and Roker Media. And really what we've been doing is working across all platforms to produce uh, programming on live streams. So that's our sole focus. So I'm very delighted to be with this group here. Talk Thank you. It. Thanks for joining us. So with the preamble, let's talk about what the session's going to be about. You know, video owners today, they need to reach a, a myriad of screens, right? We're all familiar with that. Um, if you're here, you're, you're probably aware of those trends. It's a fractured ecosystem of formats. Um, so some say it's not easy, but standards like HLS, MPEG Dash, Common Encryption are really trying to drive efficiency and simplify the, the delivery of this content, uh, delivering premium content and premium video experience to multiple devices um, it can really be a challenge. Uh, and in order to do so successfully, content owners need to be able to support multiple formats. And today we're gonna to hear from these leaders about how we're solving these problems and the advantages they experience when adopting the best format for that particular program. So we're just gonna dive in, we're gonna keep this topical. Um, and, and so feel free to jump in, panelists. I may throw a question on one of you, but please, please feel free to offer your opinion. So when you're thinking about reaching the myriad of devices out there. It's more than just smartphones, it's more than laptops, PCs, and Macs. You know, we're talking about uh, today's keynote you know, on the Roku platform, the Apple TV, Chromecast. Um, there's a variety there uh, out there. So what are your opinions to start with from a very high level on build versus buy? We have a difference of opinion de depending on what digital leadership you talk to. Um, ben, I'll go ahead and start with you. Yeah, I think we have a really deliberate uh, philosophy around build versus buy, and that is that if it's commoditized or it's moving towards commoditization or it's something that isn't going to be differentiating to the business, we want to buy it or lease it. Um, you know, I think the industry moves so quickly that leasing, particularly you know, leasing services in the cloud, leasing computing power in the cloud, but even now if we're talking about leasing and coding infrastructure in the cloud. Anything we can lease kind of wait for things to mature and grow, we're going to buy it 
but we also are looking really hard at the key problems day to day uh, and ways to differentiate the business. And we realize that if we don't build some things, we become just like everyone else. And so you have to reserve those key innovative points that differentiate your business. You have to work with your vendors that you are buying from to leave you that openness to innovate because otherwise you just become an also ran. And that's, you know, that's death in a large media company. You have to have that capability. Yeah, Jeff, Viacom's a big media brand with a lot of brands underneath it. What's the strategy there? What, what do you, you think about build versus buy? It's, uh, so we're a big fan of building technology ourselves. But as Ben says, it's not, it doesn't make sense to build things that are already commoditized. We don't want to build our own CDN. But we do tend to build our own players and our own analytics. And our, we're even building our own uh, ad stitching technology. So we're we found it's often easier and more cost effective to build things than it is to buy them and then integrate them because the cost of integration is often very high when there are very, we've got a lot of very specific use cases that we need to account for in our applications. Kirby, in a customized viewing experience, you're in the business of building these for your customers. Um, talk about the difference in, that you've seen in some organizations who, again, approach the commoditized and not in a bad way, approach to licensing technology that's out there versus building it themselves. Sure. Um, so, I mean, for any media company, there is a decision to, are we a technology company or are we a content publishing company? And, and certainly, uh, Viacom's approach are building a lot of cool tech. Um, but, I mean, building these services, I mean, there, there's just so much fragmentation from really everywhere you look. And the more I thought about this panel, the more I realized how fragmented this is. I mean, from my standpoint, what Float Left does is we get content to all your uh, new and emerging platforms. And I mean, it's, it's, it's fragmented. You have device manufacturers acting as the app store. You have certain OSs operating as their own device, but leasing their, their operating system to other, um, other uh, smart TV platforms. And it's, it's just when you think about the content and, and DRM, and some DRM technologies are supported on one platform versus the other. Um, not to mention the different codecs and uh, HLS support versus MPEG dash. It's you want to try to build that. Um, so certainly, I mean, there's a reason that there's folks like Float Left and Break Codes in existence. So we make it a lot easier and, and help increase time to market and streamline a lot of this stuff. So our customers can focus on being a content company versus trying to become a technology company. And Ron, from what you guys are building um, under the Roker umbrella, it seems to me at least uh, that you're using. Um, technologies that are already existing out in the marketplace, like Facebook Live and, exactly. and Periscope, right? So yes. perspective there, too? Yeah, I would say the DNA of Roker collectively, us as a group, is really not that of being a tech company. We're really, at heart, a marketing and programming organization. So we've said you know, to the public that what we want to do is create the first LSN, so the first network on a cell phone, basically a live streaming network. And that means that we're producing, usually in partner, partnership with others, original programming or with influencers and putting them out across a myriad of platforms. So we said early on we're going to be agnostic to platform. Those platforms include Twitch, where we actually broadcast our first live two-hour show last night. It's going to be on again this night. Excellent platform. Um, this is why we're agnostic. It's owned by Amazon. I think they're pretty good with technology. We could certainly never compete in that space, so we wanted to just zone in on where, you know, to the points of the other gentleman here, we could add value. And that's the same with um, Periscope, now Twitter, Facebook Live. What we do is build on those platforms. So your question about what we want to own is really two things. One, IP ownership and what we create, so the programming. And secondly, and this is really critical to us, it's the data of the viewers. So ultimately, our goal, if you think about QVC, I mentioned it a little bit earlier today, real-time optimization of live stream programming. That's where we're going. So that's why um, that's what we want to own. It's Great, portable. thank you. Kirby, you touched on this earlier. I want to talk about MPEG Dash with the panel, but I want to tee that up for a second. And, and for some of you in the room who have been in this space for a long time, you may chuckle and laugh at this. But it wasn't that long ago that we had to engineer these architectures to support Flash, QuickTime, um, Windows Media. You know, So we had serv streaming servers that had names like Darwin and FMS and IIS. And, it was this very fragmented view of the world in terms of media delivery. It was very complex. Um, you know, it required 
um, you know, you really roll your sleeves up and, and know what you're doing, and, but also manage a hodgepodge of streaming infrastructure. Today, I think we've gotten a lot further toward standardization or, or at least simplifying that stack. And MPEG Dash is a, is a step in that direction. Um, it's certainly gaining traction in uh, the Asia PAC region and, and in Europe. I think it's slowly gaining traction here. So I want to ask the panelists, what's, what's the worldview of MPEG Dash today? Uh, you know, Jeff, you and I vaguely know each other from the Flash world from years past, but where are we today with MPEG Dash and how is it impacting you and your organization? Jeff, we'll start with you. So I've been a big proponent of Dash for many years. I was one of the initial authors of the Dash JS player. And so I'm very bullish on Dash. However, currently Viacom is an HLS everywhere shop. So I am working to uh, adjust the direction of the, uh, the big ship, but we don't move that fast. So it just takes a little while to get us to turn. Kirby? Well, I like the promises of um, reducing costs and, and streamli streamlining workflow. I think we'll get to a place where you see uh, more, more people going full on with Dash. But I mean, right now, it really depends on the end clients being able to support it and trying to launch somebody across a bunch of different devices, a lot of which are in use legacy platforms that don't support Dash. Most of our clients are still using HLS to, to see those streams across all the platforms. Yeah, I think uh, to add a little bit more color, and, and Ben, I want your opinion here too, but it seems it's almost there's a subset here of the device manufacturers, right? Is it, is it incentivize Apple to support Dash? I think a lot of us would say that, you know, the answer is no, but they're getting, they inch closer and closer. Um, you know, does Google support it? Do these other, you know, device manufacturers and the, and the guys who make the silicon, are they invested in this or is it, is it all just about grabbing audience and content? So, um, Ben, what, what's Dash look like inside of Sinclair? Yeah, I mean, I, we're very much where Viacom is. We're, we're an HLS everywhere shop, and that's because that's where the audience is. That's where the addressable audience is. Uh, not only that, but beyond the, the, the video delivery, you know, uh, protocol and format, um, there's a massive ecosystem, and we rely heavily on advertising-based revenue. And so the advertising space you know, makes this more complicated. I mean, you know, we have challenges really moving between VPaid and Vast on the advertising side, and, and it works great with HLS. HLS is you know, this manifest-driven technology that allows us to do things uh, that literally alter the, you know, alter the manifests on top of the HLS stream to get a better experience on a per-device basis. And, we're very, very focused on you know, how much of the experience, how much of the technology can we move left in the process. Uh, not, to, not to steal your name there, but uh, we have a whole initiative at, at Sinclair Digital called Shift Left, which is basically like how far left in the process, how far server side can we push <laughs> every decision so that we don't have to rely on client side players and client side adoption and client side technologies because one of those is scalable and the other one is not. Uh, one of those is manageable and the other one is not. And so uh, as much as I love the promise of these from a technology standpoint, and I'm an engineer by trade and you know, by training, but I've, I've learned that you need adoption or there's no audience for what you build. And so that has been our philosophy. We're getting much, much better at driving that forward. And we're hitting 99 plus percent of our audience with HLS today. Great. Um, well, and you kind of touched on packaging, which I want to get to here in a second. But First, let's talk about security. So especially for live linear streams, it seems that uh, until very recently, it was OK to protect the content, maybe with AES encryption, but proper DRM wasn't a requirement. And I think it's fair to say that's changing, um, even here in North America, where DRM seems to be a bad word. Um, even if you're a network where you're not offering episodic or I should say feature length content, um, and it's just your you know, your, your standard grade uh, episodic entertainment, sitcoms, et cetera, there still is an emerging requirement for DRM. So I want to pull the panel here and see what, what you think in your world, you know, or your, your legal department or your deal guys coming to you saying, we must now use a play ready or a, uh, a um, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the name. The, the, uh, uh, fair play, thank fair you. Play. Fair play, uh, fair play encryption. Um, ben, back, what's, what's, it, what's happening? Yeah, so, uh, so I mean, we do every kind of deal imaginable at Sinclair. I mean, uh, television, especially local television and you know, nationally syndicated television is a very complex game from a contractual standpoint. Uh, we deal in movies, we deal in you know, first run movies, second run movies, you know, episodic content, you know, owned and operated content that's news, 
and the rights are just, in, especially in the news programming, the rights are insane. Um, our digital rights for distribution for sports content, for instance, even highlights, they are incredibly narrow. I mean, if, if we own the operation, if we own it, we can, we can do live streaming of it to first party properties, but not second party properties. So we have deep, deep integrations going on all the way into the production side of the house where we're flagging things as being you know, owned by this right or that right and where they can go out, out, of, the, out of the channels. Um, we also work with large studios like MGM on you know, large scale you know, cable distributed brands like Comet TV where we're taking you know, own content from MGM and if we want to distribute it you know, uh, standard definition, it has different rights than if we want to distribute it high definition because they're worried about the content getting out there and getting archived by somebody and so it has to be you know, hyper encrypted. And we manage all of that through a series of tools that we're baking in with companies like Avid. So uh, to say that DRM is a challenge and you know, a focus for us would be way underestimating the impact it's having on our day-to-day -day operations. I mean, literally every time we get a show, we have to work through this DRM scenario and talk about where it can and can't go and whether our processes will even support it. Uh, so it's, it's something that we're actively engaged in constantly. It's, it's heavyweight and it's not one size fits all by a long shot. But even in an authenticated TVE world, is that still a requirement if it's your, let's like, say, Cairo in Seattle? Yeah, so it depends. Um, so if we, have on, if we have a TVE arrangement and we happen to have negotiated the rights for the TVE distribution, generally it's okay for live simulcast, but not VOD. Um, if we distribute to a third party and they wanna do TVE, we don't necessarily have the right, for instance, we work with a company called NewsOn, where we distribute our news content, and zero of our kind of content embargo rights translate to them, no matter what. It doesn't matter. TVE, nothing. It's just the way that the deals are built don't lend itself to this. So what I can say is that our legal department has been excellent at really walking people down the road and saying, you are missing out on the audience. You need to relax some of these these legal obligations. You need to understand that the audience is shifting to digital. And if you have these kinds of restrictive rights, people are just not going to see your content. And I think there is a sea change happening a little bit at a time where I think a lot of this is going to relax. But DRM and encryption and people worried about people stealing their content is, you know, that's never going away. Uh, it's going to get a little easier to distribute things over the next couple of years. But it's going to get harder and harder as we go to like, you know, go to 4K and 8K. You know, that kind of quality people are worried about, you know, I gave you my content for a year. How do I know 20 million people didn't get it on a BitTorrent, right? How do, we, how do we keep that from happening? And that's what keeps me up at night. I don't know the answer yet. We're working on it. Great answer. Someone put that on Twitter. Hashtag SML. <laughs> uh, Jeff? Yeah, so we have a very different situation where the vast majority of the content that we have on digital is owned by us. And so we have a lot more flexibility in determining what level of stream protections we need. So there's very little content that we use a full-blown DRM on. We, you know, anything out of Paramount Studios, which is part of Viacom, or anything that's with Epix, does use full DRM. But most of our own content, we need to do, you know, it needs to be protected enough, which is uh, a term that our legal department can define better than I can. <laughs> Jeff, is it safe to say that you have to do a cost the benefit analysis because it's not cheap either. Exactly. To roll, roll right. Full DRM. It certainly comes into it as well. Ron, kind of a related but a slightly different question, you know, 2A. So when Periscope became so popular a year to 18 months ago, I, I, there was a, a, a boxing uh, event that was a pay per view, and I was watching almost the entire event on Periscope. And it occurred to me as a technologist, there's a problem here. And I don't know if it has to do with forensic watermarking and, and flagging it when these things happen, but what's, the, you know, what's your view in terms of leveraging these technologies to build these live channels you're talking about, but also being respectful of copyright and not allowing people or viewers to replicate something that may be you know, legally uh, prohibited to do so? Right. I make a good on a couple different avenues um, with the answer. I'll just say that what from a right standpoint, we're actually looking at creating unique formats on live streams. So it could be, for instance, a game show that we'll develop with our host or hostess and the viewing community. You know, really, literally starting to put together entirely new shows. 
So that's going to create not only uh, an IP you know, rights issue here and abroad, but we also are looking at packaging the archive shows and redistributing, redistributing them over various OTT platforms. So we've actually already been testing that. That is moving us down you know, a legal path. Um, we obviously have legal representation. Um, but when it comes to Periscope, that was the boxing match. I think they're all being streamed there. Um, you notice that shortly thereafter, Twitter, which owns Periscope, partnered with, I think, the NFL. So they're starting actually to directly partner with these major league and, and sports organizations in order to, I think, circumvent or, or stop some of the rights issues that are inevitably going to happen when you have things like social media. Um, we obviously aren't you know, promoting it at all, and it's something that we're just not involved with. But it's clearly, it's going to be a big issue as, as we go. OK. Uh, last topic or question on security. Does common media encryption help at all? Now, we've talked about the, the business implications, the legal implications. Does, does, that, does the technology piece of common media uh, encryption help? Very little? I think it's still DRM. It, it's still DRM. I, yeah. I, lo I love the idea of common encryption, and I think it, it makes a lot of sense. It's not particularly applicable for us just yet, but uh, I think it's, it solves a lot of problems, just not the problems I have today. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> okay. Um, so we've talked about the universe of, of devices. So you know, from the content to the market to the devices, there's tons of fragmentation, especially on, on Android. It's what I like to call as the Windows, Windows of mobile. Um, so what are the challenges and the pitfalls? What do you have to think about as technologists and architects and people who develop the back-end infrastructure, the applications, everything that's required to, to drive that user experience? You know, how do you solve for this? What are some of the things, you know, the, what, these are the pitfalls we want to touch on so that the audience gets some key takeaways here. What do you have to think about in this fragmented world? How do you solve for all these problems? I, I mean, I can say that the, where you start is you have to ask yourself where the audience really is. And so one of the things that, that is a constant exercise for us is you know, which versions of the OSs, which devices, which combinations of those are really driving the audience. And you know, if you go long tail and you're worried about the last 3%, you, know, you have tens of thousands of devices possibly. I actually spent a year at the Amazon App Store you know, running the system that cataloged every possible device as it lit up and we would literally see devices light up in the lab you know, and, and so it is impossible to do that. So you just can't. You have to kind of pick the top 20 or 25 devices. And then our response has been, you know, can we, can we standardize on something like HLS? Can we standardize on the protocols we use? And can we, we've literally innovated and put things in place that rewrite the manifest headers for different devices, detect the device, you know, work with the CDN providers so that the CDN is detecting that device and giving a different cache response. Um, and we have, you know, two or three patents pending on this and the ad stitching technology. And so this is where we've decided it's not commoditized. There are serious problems in the industry that need to be solved. And if we pick the right mix of technologies on the server side and we hone in on the 99%, the 98% of the audience, we can provide a really consistent, good experience that we can manage and monitor and test and retest consistently and continually improve. But what we can't do is you know, build an SDK for 200 devices. Like, we can't, we don't have the staff to do that. I think some people do attack it that way and uh, I haven't seen that be successful on Moss, but uh, you know, there's probably somebody out there doing it. Yeah. So we, again, we've got a different set of challenges where with all of our various brands, the users of MTV and Comedy Central and VH1 tend to be a, an older audience. They tend to have newer phones. The users of our kids and family, the Nickelodeon, Nick Jr., Noggin, tend to be on hand-me-down phones. And so we need to have a much longer tail in supporting those applications, which is unfortunate and, you know, costly. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, we've, like you said, you need to know where your audience is and be in the right place for that. Ron? Yeah, our approach is uh, different. You know, I look at um, what we do as really interactive television in many ways. So we really think of um, the platforms that we're on as being user generated. So we're not streaming, um, you know, sophisticated, uh, you know, 
sports programming or entertainment, a lot of it is authentically oriented around literally someone's bedroom, you know, like a YouTube. So, so our challenges are how do you do the technical shoot? Um, you know, what do you need to bring into the shoot? What platform are you using? What's the deliverability going to look like? And then ultimately, like, do they have APIs? And can you get the audience data back? So we're very audience centric. For instance, like, um, other than Twitch, uh, Periscope doesn't have a public API where you can really do a lot of data analysis other than what they provide to really analyze what the viewers are seeing, where they're from, what time of days work, typical day parting if you're you know, an advertiser. So we approach it almost from the viewer um, and way out front versus the technical infrastructure side. That's the challenge that keeps us up at night is how do we shoot it, how do we execute the shoot, how do we collect the data so that we can optimize it? Different. Kirby, from a, from a presentation perspective, do you, as an organization, have to get into some of this, like Ben was talking about, and say, okay, we're going to build an experience where we're only going to go back to Android version you know, 4 or whatever it is and, and iOS 6, you know, because that's where the audience is. How does, how does that calculation work? Yeah, certainly, just, just as Ben said, it's where the audience is. I'm not, we're not going to build an app for a platform nobody's using or has been... Uh, shelved by the manufacturer. So, uh, and, and it's not just the back end, that's, uh, that's fragmented. fragmented uh, speak, when I think of Android, I think of all the different device sizes and the pixel densities and even on the TV side, I mean, there's so many different uh, resolutions that you have to develop an interface for. So when you see things like uh, the Nickelodeon or Comedy Central app on a Roku, I mean, there's three different resolutions that it was created for. So whether you're running a, a Roku channel in SD mode or HD or Ultra HD, I mean, that interface has to be developed for, that, uh, for the different supported resolutions. So obviously phone, tablet, very different, and TV as well, but even the TV, there's different uh, resolutions you need to account for in being able to deliver a product. Great. You guys have all, or you've, some of you have touched on this, and I want to get into the notion of delivering content to a viewer at the time they request it so that you don't have to create so many renditions and, and think about this, you know, these piles of content that represent shows and episodes and you know, you've got this litany of content. So it's been referred to for the last couple of years, this isn't a very new concept, but just in time packaging. But lately, um, I've heard it referred to more as, as dynamic, dynamic delivery or packaging and late binding. And this means applying things like DRM and encoding the right flavor of content for a particular device, not just for you know, a flavor of, of, of compression, if you will, not uh, an eight stream ladder of HLS, but more like a file or three files delivered to this individual person. So let's talk about your opinions and, and where you think this type of, of delivery uh, mode might go or, and how it might help the industry. Because you know, early analysis says that it might save people as much as one third on their storage and delivery costs. So Jeff, start with you. So it's interesting. We're currently we do all of our packaging through one of the CDNs and using their dynamic packaging. And we're moving into our own static packaging now. But again, as, that's actually static though, not dynamic in the way that you're looking at it. But with the idea is trying to make things as cacheable as possible. We have you know with all of the various p content that we have across all the devices, we want the CD to leverage as much as we can from CDNs. So I'm really not terribly interested today in creating a separate version for each user because that would probably overwhelm us. Is, uh, so, but, but the notion of delivering it in real time but still maintaining a, an archive of that, is, it, is there too many, is it, you think there's too many operations going on at once for it to be viable for you? It's, it, right now it seems like there is. It's, I mean, we're intri we will keep a, basically a packaged origin that will then all have all the CDNs come back to that for the content. And behind that, we'll have our, all of our mezzanine files that we can re-encode as we need to. But uh, that is the direction we're currently in. Ben? Yeah, so one of our big focuses is, is again, addressing that mezzanine format and how, how good a mezzanine format can we get to the, get to the cloud, basically, and, and have there. Uh, we do use dynamic packaging, and we're actually working with our vendors at the CDN level and at the encoding level to to kind of teach their, I mean, inform using data, trying to understand where the audience is, how they consume, what gives them the best experience. Like, how many different formats do you really need? How many, is it 10, is it 12, is it 112, you know? And so 
here's the challenge. It's, it's, it's a math equation, unfortunately. It's like, if I need 112, then potentially I could save 30%. If I need 12, I save zero. Right. Because all 12 are gonna be used, right? And so, and there's a spectrum in the middle. And so, static packaging, if you can arrive at like 15 to 20 to even 30 formats, like right. someone's gonna consume all 30 of those formats somehow if you've got a pretty good audience. If you're talking about 150 different types and different bit formats to get really, really super tuned user experience, A, you're gonna have to prove to me that you're really getting that. But because that's... now you're talking about, you know, if you, if you go from 100 to 30, you're saving 70% right, on, on your storage and your encoding costs. And maybe static works at that point. Right, so I mean, ultimately we're, we're looking to have, you know, for each asset, we, I think we have seven renditions and we're looking to be able to deliver it in two different codecs, in VP9 and H.264. The idea is that we'll go dash VP9 and HLS H.264, and so really that is then 14 versions of each asset. But having run the numbers, I know how many times I have to serve each asset each month in order for it to be cost effective, and in terms of the storage versus delivery. And again, I can then automatically purge it if we're not getting the numbers. If people aren't watching the content, it shouldn't be sitting there in active storage. Absolutely. Kirby, Ron, any, any opinions? You're not an obligated one, but. I just say now you know why we're platform agnostic. <laughs> <laughs> and my answer is a little different because we're on the front end where everybody here is more uh, geared towards the back end. And how we apply dynamic packaging is, is from the app standpoint. So whether it's uh, a core app we would build to support all the smart TV HTML platforms, if we can render something that identifies, this is a Samsung TV, that's render the, that resolution, that's render the Samsung hotkeys at the bottom of the screen, or there's actually something we're working on with a, with a company right now where there's a lot of live streaming and live events, and we're creating a dynamic playback, so we have a linear, we have a linear feed with um, a lot of metadata. Uh, coinciding with that stream. So we're like loading tabs and, and informative things, interactive experiences on top of a video screen based on that associated meta metadata, creating a dynamic user experience. Great, good feedback. So I wanna finish with one topic and then we'll get to questions. So it may be the topic of the show actually. So Flash is walking slowly toward its end of days, right? At, at the end of the year, at least we're told. Uh, Chrome's not gonna support it and many other browsers and ad exchanges are saying that user will have to invoke something or it just flat out won't work. So let's talk about your organizations uh, and what you see playing out of, you know, through the end of the year. Some have said that a lot of technology companies and a lot of, of content creators and broadcasters and networks have their head on a swivel and they're prepared for this and that it's a, a problem with the creative side of the business. But let's talk about that. So what does it mean for you through the end of the year? How are you preparing for Flash changing uh, viewing habits? Yeah, I mean, for us, uh, we've seen this developing for a long time. If you're following the HTML5 movement, the point of HTML5 was to get rid of Flash. Uh, because it's just intrinsically not a good user experience to have to load a plugin into the browser, invoke another you know, piece of technology. It, there are challenges there. There were sites for a while that had a wholly Flash experience to, over, to overcome this, particularly entertainment-based sites. You know, like, the, the, the site that was the companion to the movie launch or the companion to the show launch would be heavily interactive, very, very sexy, right? And you just supplanted any kind of web container at all. You took over the whole screen with Flash, uh, which, was, which was a terrific experience if it was heavily produced, right? It just wasn't very scalable. Uh, and so HTML5 has been on a mission to kill this. So we've been on a mission to, to, to get it there. Um, and, and just to kind of piggyback on, on the things that Kirby has said and you know, the things that, that, that Ron has said is that data and user experience, if you're not working backward from data and user experience to get to these backend solutions and there isn't a bridge, and you don't either have partners that are working with you on that, you've got a problem. And, and so Flash was so specialized that I think it's a blessing in disguise. We've been working on it. We, we already have stuff in the works right now that are gonna be detecting Flash not, not enabled and not there. And, going to be switching out the video player. We have custom HTML5 video players we're deploying. We're working with JW Player as a, as a vendor on the website to fix these problems. And we've been out ahead of it. And so, uh, you know, if I was going to recommend something, I would say, you know, get there, get comfortable, because it is going to go away sooner 
rather than later, you know, 12 months from now, I don't think we're going to be seeing much flash at all. And the, the advertising is also going to pivot there, right, away from that, the flash-based advertising because it has problems. So mm -hmm. there, there are real challenges, there are business challenges, there's advertising inventory challenges, and now the technology is catching up with what the businesses really need. And so I think it's all a good thing, and people need to be on top of it. Kirby? I mean, this doesn't really affect me. You don't have Flash running on Apple TV and Roku, but what I will say is I have a heavy background in UI UX, and, and I, 15 years ago, I was thinking, oh, every website should be done Flash, and that was the mantra at the time, and so if it's ending, great. <laughs> Jeff? As a longtime Flash developer, it pains me how happy I am about this. <laughs> But ultimately, it is with all of the various brands, my team writes all of the components, all the video players and ads and analytics that get used across all of the brands. And it's difficult to get everyone to upgrade to a new version. And this is actually forcing everybody. It's like, okay, we need to get the latest and greatest. So it's actually, it's solving a lot of problems for me that it wasn't really intended to solve, but it's a, a nice unintended consequence for me. But I'll miss Flash. Although the hard part for us, honestly, is gonna be the Nickelodeon properties for a lot of games, and porting those all over to HTML is going to be uh, challenging. Wow. Ron, I would guess that the Roker companies are built for the future, so you're probably not facing much challenge here. Yeah, you uh, read my mind. I mean, <laughs> since we've been doing this now for the last couple of years, not one person has mentioned Flash. Good for you. So we live in a dream world in New York. It's Very nice. nice. <laughs> Great. Well, let's open up for questions. Anyone have any uh, other technical or... Tactical questions for the panel. Nadine? So, when you're talking about data and user experience, then, what are the most important things you would tell media companies that they should focus on? Is it from end point or from the So, from a, let me repeat the question. From, from a data and user experience, what are the, some of the most important things that they would advise uh, companies as they look at that, that information? Uh, so, for us, it really starts with audience segmentation. Do you know who your audience is? Do you know what they watch? Do you know what they consume? And can you react to trends in their discovery habits uh, and their consumption habits? And are you looking at the intersections between this content discovery, which is searching, browsing, finding stuff, and watching stuff, and going back and forth? Those are your biggest points of kind of low-hanging fruit. If you know who your audience is, you can differentiate somebody who's like an avid sports fan versus you know, somebody who just loves you know, daytime talk shows versus somebody who you know, loves first run movies. You know, their behavior patterns are very different. The user experience and the way that they discover content and watch content is very different. And you'd be amazed how fast the data will come back to you and show you obvious places you can change the user experience and increase engagement uh, and, you know, and reach. Right? Some people will abandon your sites because they come in and they're just confused about where's the stuff I care about. If I know you're a sports fan, you come to my homepage and I serve you up sports content front and center and, and, and that's what you get when you first come, you're 50 times more likely to stick around. Like not five times, 50 times. It's, and so if you're not there, get there. It's, there's so much low hanging fruit to improve the business and improve the efficacy of your properties. That's where you start. Yeah. Absolutely, and I agree with everything you said. And the other thing that we're doing a lot of is just A-B testing the hell out of everything. With, you know, we'll roll out a change to 1% of the audience and just study the metrics and see, you know, did this have a positive impact or a negative impact? And just, you know, make data-driven decisions. Don't, you know, don't decide, oh, we should do this because I think it would be cool. Let's see the data, you know, try it to a tiny segment of the audience and see if it, you know, proves out the hypothesis or disproves it. Good. Anyone else? Yes, in the back. Please stand up and speak up so I can repeat your question. Thank you. You're doing great. Oh, wait. Hang on one second. We've got a microphone coming. I stand corrected. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Tarek. I work for Twitch. My question for Jeff is why you decided to go Dash with VP9? Why not HEVC or even H.264? So it's interesting. Actually, I didn't mention HEVC. We are also looking at HEVC. What I'm really looking for is I want to find the right encoding for the right platform. So places like Apple TV or Roku where there's an HEVC decoder available, I want it. But I don't know of a single browser today that has an HEVC decoder. So 
whereas I have VP9 decoders. Edge, Edge does have, Microsoft Edge does have HVC. It needs oh. acceleration eventually, but um, it does. Well, so I've, I've got VP9 encoder, decoders in most of the browsers and in all of the Android phones. So it just makes a lot of sense because I can hit the widest swath of audience with it. Where HEVC is, you know, someday we will have it in a lot more places, but it's not there yet. Anyone else? Back in the back? Hi, you guys touched about a lot about uh, data and analytics and all those things. Are you guys doing any predictive prescriptive analytics, valuation of the content, expected traffic, and all of those things? So, uh, I, I mean, I can speak for us. We are actually working really, really hard on uh, what we're calling like deep segmented semantic, semantic analysis. And that's both from a, from a, from a visual analysis, but also from a, from a content analysis. So, any way that we can analyze the content, watch it, segment it down to kind of smaller chunks and understand what is this content about? What is, it, what is the point it's trying to get across? What's its format? You know, what device is it being kind of delivered to and what's the response? And so that allows us to do predictive things. And so we can take that data, feed it back and look at a new piece of content and to an extent predict what its reception will be. And we can give that to the producer at production time and say, okay, this thing that you've done is not going to do well, and here's why. This other thing that you've done is going to do great, and here's why, and go get more of it, right? And so we are working actively. We have about three patents pending on that process, and we have a whole bunch of partners in the mix that are helping us kind of get to that panacea of, as I produce the content, I get real-time feedback about how effective the content will be for which audience segments and on which devices, because the, the biggest challenge that we face is that you know, the content we shoot for the television doesn't play on a mobile device. It's a more intimate experience. It's a smaller form factor. Um, you know, people consume differently. They don't consume long form content as much on smaller devices. Right? And so how do we take what we produce, use predictive analytics, use data, use user experience research, use A-B testing, and like actually hand that to the people that create the content and say, hey, this thing that you're doing, it's great. This other thing you're doing, not so much. Because at the end of the day, our job is to make content producers more effective, make, that in, make this massive, sprawling digital environment coherent to them so they can go create. That's the, that's the goal. Yeah. And if we lose sight of that, something's wrong, right? Now, it's a hard problem to solve, but yeah. that's the goal. I'd add to, um, if you're interested in the live streaming world that Roker's in, if you go to Roker Labs on SlideShare, we've done what, what I think is still the only data-driven research around streams and what people are doing on the streams and where they're coming from. We did it with a company in New York called Dextro, which is a cybersecurity startup. And we literally went back to the first original Periscope stream to see what kind of data um, we could gather from the viewer standpoint, because most of us are quants and we're doing a lot of multivariate testing, but it just doesn't exist currently in live streaming. There is no search capability. So if you're looking at streams across multiple platforms, you don't know what shows on at what time. Most things are not scheduled, very difficult to find. And so there's no uh, sort of forward looking data as well. Like what, what streams do we think people would most want to watch? Like a Netflix approach doesn't exist in the live streaming world that we're in. So we've tried to do a lot of our own original research with partners. Love to talk to any others, by the way, if you're in the room. Um, it's very much the Wild West. And you know, lastly, most of the data analytics companies, if you're in the YouTube world, have been built around YouTube. They're basically what I would call fixed archived videos. When you go into the live stream world that we're in, where there's a lot of user-generated content, sometimes more than what you know, you have thousands of people watching a show commenting. Just analyzing that data, no one's really done. So there's, there's a lot of road ahead for improvements in this space, and then I think the forward-looking stuff will come next. Great. With that, we're going to wrap up. Hope we've, hopefully you've gotten some good data, and we've been educational for you. Thank you for attending, and please help me thank the panelists. Thanks. Very nice to meet you. Nice to meet you.